Hello and welcome to NB Drives. My name is Nishmanya and today's video is the first in a series of interviews I'm going to be conducting with some interesting personality, all of who have a shared passion for cars and automobiles. Now, when I introduced this channel back in late September 2023, I'd laid out a bunch of different formats I'd wanted to do and the interview style is the only one I've not been able to get to till date. I'm remedying that and hence I'm very excited to bring this new style of video to my channel and my viewers. Now when it came to doing my first interview, I thought what better day than 26 Jan, which is our 75th Republic Day. And who better to interview than a highly decorated soldier of our beloved nation. Today I have with me an officer, a thorough gentleman and a mentor. He is a decorated officer of the Indian Army and a Shaurya Chakra awardee. This is a gallantry award given for valor, courageous action and self-sacrifice, which many of you know isn't given out lightly. He's also received the Army Commander's Commendation. In his years of service to our nation, he has served in the IPKF in Sri Lanka, he has served at the borders at Siachen, Kashmir, Northeast, and he's also been part of the UN peacekeeping forces in Sierra Leone, as well as represented India as the defense attaché in Nepal. It's been my privilege to know him since childhood, as he's a very close family friend of ours, and he's seen me grow up and grow old, while I've seen him stay forever young. Over the years, I've gone to him for all sorts of different advice, be it trekking, fitness, or even raising dogs. And now I'm very happy when he comes to me for advice on cars, a field that I'm so passionate about. So without any further ado, let's meet Brigadier Ajay Pasbola Shaurya Chakra. He's of the fearsome and glorious 2x8 Gorkha Regiment, which by the way is the same regiment that gave India its first field marshal, the legendary Sam Monikshaw. He's been kind enough to take some time out. Now that he is retired, he's able to take a little bit of time out and give me an interview. So I'm very happy to have him on the channel. Jai Hind Brigadier Saab, welcome to NB Drives. Thank you very much, Nishmanya, for inviting me to your channel. I've been following you since you've uh, launched your channel and I'm very impressed with the work that you're doing. Especially impressed with the uh, way you, of course, uh, talk about the cars. And uh, especially from a point of view of uh, a person who is interested in automobiles or the person who's yeah. looking at automobiles to, for personal use. Uh, you put it so simply, so practically and uh, so interestingly that uh, uh, it helps uh, people who are not uh, into the uh, game of automobiles to understand a vehicle and take a decision. So great work you are doing and continue doing that and more kudos to you. Thank you so much. Those words of encouragement mean a lot to me. So uh, let's jump straight into the interview. The first question I wanted to ask you is, uh, how do you compare the automotive market in India uh, now against what it was when you were younger or when you were growing up? All right. So, uh... Straight away looking at it, it seems that the uh, uh, automobile market has at least done three jumps, three uh, yeah. jumps when it comes to uh, from where it was to what it was. Initially, uh, when you look at uh, the vehicles that we have seen uh, when we are growing up, there, were, there used to be the two scooters, which were Vespa and Lambretta, cars only, Fiat and Ambassador. Yeah. And um, uh, that's all uh, you followed. And these cars... Uh, were also a challenge uh, to drive because uh, they gave you a lot of trouble. They um, yeah. they needed uh, a lot of maintenance and a lot of looking after. And of course, there were there were very few on the road. So definitely today the market so is there was no you're spoiled in them either, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> you're spoiled for choice. You're spoiled for technology. You're spoiled for uh, the color. You're spoiled for the features which are there. And of course, with now a new dimension of the electric vehicle which is coming in, yeah. um, it's it's just getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, you really have pretty much all sorts of uh, price points. You have at least a handful of options to choose from. It's uh, a big step forward, I think. All of us can agree. 
Now, the next question I want to move on to was, uh, I know you've been interested in automobiles for a very long time. Uh, what brought you into this world of automobiles and like the interest around it? Uh, so I'll give a little bit of credit to my dad because um, even, even with limited resources, he always thought that having a car was important. So yeah. uh, he bought a car. Scooter, of course, was always there, but uh, he bought a car uh, fairly early as such. So when in the younger days, one saw the car being the elder son as such, one uh, got the liberty to pick the key, start the car at times, not drive it, just start the car, yeah. clean it, put water into the radiator, you know, change, help dad change tire or help someone change tire. Those, those kind of things is what uh, probably got me uh, into uh, looking at vehicles and being interested, even if not getting into too much of a uh, technical part of it. Yeah. But definitely being wanting to drive, wanting to sit in the driver's seat, get yeah. see what is there on below the hood and all that. Definitely. That was probably the starting point. I see. I'm sure you would have at least moved it around a bit sneakily, even if you want. Yeah, def definitely. Once one could reach the pedal and the, uh, the accelerator, uh, yeah. taking it out of the garage, parking it back, uh, taking it till the gate and back was something one did it whenever you one got a chance. Yeah, it also gives you great practice to get, you know, a sense of the dimensions of a car. It's probably one of the best things you can do to get comfortable with size and placement. Just move Yes, and, I, I, and and to for your viewers, because you've got a lot of young viewers. Uh, there's, yeah. there's one thing I wanted to add was that uh, I learned uh, driving a car on a, on a Fiat, which had a gear shift next to the uh, steering wheel. Column which I don't think sure. people know that, yeah, yeah. I, if people know about it or not, I'm not too sure. <laughs> well, I'll be honest, I think very few people will know, especially from the younger audiences, because uh, I think as time's going to go on, people are already starting to veer away from uh, manuals, the flow-mounted ones. So there isn't any car in our market currently that has a column-mounted manual shifter that anyone will be familiar with. Uh, all right. So moving on to the next question, uh, what kind of vehicles did you get to experience in your time in the army? You would have got a fairly large uh, array of different kind of vehicles you would have been exposed to. Absolutely. So uh, I, I feel that the interesting part uh, of the vehicles in the army for me was firstly, initially, initial part of my service. Because uh, that is the time uh, you had the Willys Jeep, which is available. Yeah. You had the Jonga, which Jonga, was available. Yes. And and then uh, my favorite, uh, not because uh, I wanted to ride that, but because that's the only vehicle one was allowed as a youngster to sit in, was the one ton. Uh, yeah. A 1,000cc engine, a Nissan engine, uh, yeah. a powerful vehicle, a guzzler. And you would be amazed that even in a steep hill, uh, yeah. 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 30 degrees uh, slope, yeah. you could start that vehicle on second gear. Rather, you always started that vehicle wow. in second gear. What an amazing vehicle, but a guzzler. <laughs> well, okay. So that is where, uh, so that that is the initial part. Yeah. Uh, subsequently, of course, we we got, uh, the army got into the, uh, the stage where we were wanting to make our own vehicle. We didn't really come up with it. So we, we compromised yeah. on Maruti which probably was not very good uh, vehicle for the army, but we continued with that, uh, the gypsy. Yeah. Uh, but uh, from the truck side, we were already very good. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, Maruti gypsy. So yeah. from the truck side, we were already very good. We had the Shaktiman and yeah. uh, Shaktiman uh, was a vehicle which actually you needed to be a Shaktiman to drive it. There <laughs> were no power steering. So the people who were driving it actually needed muscles to be able to steer it. And uh, when you were taking these hairpin bends, uh, you had to do one reverse and take it up. Oh, uh, so wow. that power was there. Uh, then uh, double uh, declutching. Again, that's another issue. I'm not sure whether uh, you would know. Of course, there, if there are more trucks and vehicles which are there. But uh, it, it, it got you interested in, you know, being able to because it, it was difficult to drive these vehicles. So the yeah. challenge was there. So you enjoyed also, getting onto the vehicles. Also, you better understanding there. of the mechanicals of uh, these vehicles also. So, with yeah, that. definitely, because uh, uh, in our case, you know, you uh, as an officer, you are told to learn everything. So, yeah. some bit of uh, uh, knowing about the vehicle engine and all is also taught to you. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, at times you can help people or at least guide them and command people who are uh, doing this work is taught to you. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Also, before we move on, uh, you had mentioned double D clutching. So, for people who are not quite aware of what that is, 
essentially uh, older cars uh, because of the way the gearboxes were designed uh, to get the longest life out of a gearbox and also to uh, shift smoothly. Essentially, double declutching was you press the clutch to bring it into neutral and then clutch again before you put it into your desired gear. Um, that was also because of the lack of synchros in the gearbox. So just in case yes. you were wondering what uh, this term is and what uh, it meant to drive those trucks, just imagine like with that weight, with uh, so much uh, input going in from the driver, that's just one extra step they have to keep in mind every time they change gear. Absolutely. And of course, um, uh, because um, uh, one was in the uh, strike core area, so uh, one got exposed to a lot of uh, um, uh, A vehicles, as we call them, that is the tanks and the BMPs and the BRDMs. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, typically a tank, which is there, uh, uh, a 46, 50 ton vehicle. Uh, which is, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, uh, one thing I must tell you that for you to be able to get into a tank, you have to be fit because a person yeah. who's big, who's fat cannot get into a tank. Yeah. So you have to be fit because it has, it's very constricted and um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful vehicle which can uh, move uh, almost at about 40 to 45 kilometers uh, per hour yeah. on, a, on a road, not, yeah. not cross country, but on a yeah. road. And uh, but but it is uh, amazing to handle because whether uh, going down a dune or climbing up a dune, uh, yeah. it hugs the ground and moves and it's uh, lovely. Uh, but tough to drive because uh, it doesn't have a standard steering. It has got these shifts which you you know take up yeah, and down and uh, move the that. tank like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah you do that uh, for taking the uh, tank up and down. Of course, you have the clutch and the brake to be able to move it. And um, uh, it's a powerful vehicle and uh, it's, it's an experience by itself. Absolutely. Because uh, I think a lot of thing, a lot of times people won't be able to quite place how big a tank really is until you really come up close to one. And even what you're saying about getting into one, uh, you like just climbing up onto one to get in. Uh, it's an insane experience. Um, and also, so, people don't tend to realize just how fast uh, 40, 45 kph in yes, a yes. vehicle that heavy is. It's ridiculous. Yes, yes, yes. And um, uh, of course, um, uh, these kind of vehicles, the uh, vehicles which are there, they don't talk about kilometers per hour. Yeah. They talk about uh, um, uh, liters per kilometer. <laughs> they don't yeah. talk about kilometers per liter. They talk about liters per kilometer. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a very big departure from how we view our uh, regular cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're chasing every extra kilometer you can get out of that liter yes. and uh, just flip. That's crazy. Um, also, I remember when I was younger, I wasn't old enough to get behind the wheel, but you did help me get onto a tank and experience it from the top. Uh, I, that experience in itself was, I think, it's hard to explain to people who have not uh, been around it, but I remember being so overjoyed with that um, that entire experience. And as you said, in terms of driving, it's like pretty much nothing else you'll get to experience. Maybe, may, maybe, maybe, maybe one uh, uh, one uh, one of your programs with the tanks. We should plan one. Absolutely, I will be thrilled to get behind the wheel of a tank. And uh, I also want to check if there are any other sort of armored uh, vehicles you got to drive, like the light armored uh, troop movers, any of those. Yeah, so I did mention them, BMP. Yeah. BMP is a track vehicle which is there, which yeah. uh, Indian Army holds. And uh, that uh, we don't have any half trackers with us. We have yeah. the BMPs which are there, yeah. uh, which are uh, for, uh, it doesn't have the similar kind of armor protection which is there. So therefore it yeah. is much lighter. But it moves very fast and has a similar kind of uh, movement which is there. It carries about 10 men uh, yeah. in the body without, besides the driver and the gunner which is there uh, and the navigator who are there. Uh, we also have the BRDMs. BRDMs are wheeled, uh, similar vehicle but wheeled. Yeah. For use for same purpose. So we don't have half trackers but we have the BRDMs and BMPs. Uh, yeah. Of course, those are also um, uh, amazing vehicles, very powerful. Russian vehicles, both of them. And uh, that is why the thing, of course, we, uh, for, for the uh, uh, 
uh, go gun towing and all we have yeah. scania which is again yeah. uh, uh, a 8x8 eight eight, which is there powerful yeah. vehicle uh, very modern the very very good so those vehicles yeah. have also today of course the range of vehicles is improving and increasing when it comes to the indian army yeah absolutely uh, all right so moving on to the next question um there is you have this yamaha rx100 bike and um, you've had it for a while and you recently well not recently but a little while back decided to undertake a restoration so could you give us a little bit of an idea of uh, when you got this bike a little bit of history about how long you've had it and then we'll get into your uh, experience restoring it so again uh, probably uh, because my dad was interested in vehicles so he was generous enough to lend me some money so i contributed half the money my dad gave me half the money and uh, we bought the motorcycle way back in uh, 1989 Yeah so 1989 is when we bought this is the time that the Yamaha uh, had already started coming in i think it yeah. came in in about 86 or 87 in came in and uh, these Yamaha motorcycles were still the original one which were being uh, sent uh, coming directly we yeah. hadn't started our manufacturing plant as yet so therefore these were the original bikes which are there yeah. um, i love the bike one uh, one got to ride it uh, long distance also i've done uh, uh, dehradun delhi a number of times i've done delhi uh, indore and mau a number of times so one has been in using that bicycle motorcycle yeah although only 100 cc Uh, but uh, yeah. that itself was a good good power and uh, you yeah, know back then, uh, i also love the yeah uh, yes i also love the noise that uh, the sound that not noise the sound that uh, yeah. uh, yamaha rx100 makes um, it can't be compared to a bullet but yeah. it has a very distinct sound and it's uh, lovely so for all of um, uh, about 70000 rupees is what we bought that uh, motorcycle for at that time which, which was a lot of money a yeah. lot of money Yes, yes, it was expensive because uh, uh, because it was a uh, you know it was an imported. item in the, in the yeah imported. imported and it it was not really very common today. There are so many motorcycles are spoiled for choice, so therefore the rates yeah. have gone down. Yeah, so yeah. that time the rates were high. So that was a very expensive motorcycle, but one bought that and yeah. one used it for a long time, and okay. uh, one has kept it since. Um, since then, I've had the motorcycle with me, moving from most of the time in the truck. uh but yeah. whatever little time i get i use it all right so just walk us a little bit through the timeline of restoration like how the thought came about and um, you know the amount of time it took to get it restored from when you began the process so uh, the uh, motorcycle is like i said has been with me since uh, 89 yeah. and uh, probably for the first 20 uh, for, for the first 15 16 years i used it extensively yeah. after that it just got parked Uh, my nephew used it for a little while but then uh, uh, bigger bikes came and he went on to bigger bikes and that bike yeah. was standing yeah. almost for about uh, 15 years it was just parked wow. not moving and a lot of people were um, uh, there were suggestions made that why don't you dispose it off and uh, all but that i didn't have the heart to do it one had loved it one had uh, a lot of memories with it yeah. yes a lot of memories with it so one wanted to keep it so one has kept that um uh, then this thought came to me that uh, let me try and get this bike back to uh, the shape that it was however finding a person was very difficult um i was in dehradun uh, dehradun was known for these kind of things but i couldn't find anyone who could do that yeah. gorakhpur lucknow i checked no one uh, i went i got posted to alabad and that's where uh, while checking finding this thing i found a small shop where uh, this person called munna lal uh had um, uh, all the things that he promised to give me the bike in the original shape and uh, because restoration there's no point of restoring a bike if you're going to not have the spare parts original spare parts original color original yeah. thing you're not you're not uh, you know changing the anything in the bike you should get it yeah. the way it is so that yeah. guy promised me i when he told me that he will do that i i said no first you tell me the plan show me the pictures show me the parts and then only i'll uh, give you yeah. which he was very good at he showed me all that uh, you won't believe some of the parts were still packed in their original packing uh, wow. spare parts that he said which was amazing of yeah. course some parts uh, were uh, second hand parts which he was cannibalizing from other motorcycles which is fair i mean there you can't get everything yeah. new with a bike which is so old uh, 
Absolutely. And he had shown me that he would, uh, you know, get me the same original color, the same shape, the same, uh, everything was same. So he did that. Yeah. Uh, from the time that I gave him, so our other the, besides this thing, what he told me was don't push me. When I start restoring the bike, yeah. there's no timeline. So yeah. I said, I understand that. You take your time. So yeah. he took about five months to restore the bike. He, okay. he kept sending me pictures and it was nice and easy and uh, there was there was no hurry that uh, he uh, he took on that and um, it took a same amount of money that I took to purchase the bike to get it restored. Wow. So the same price I got. Yes, the same wow. price I paid for getting it restored. Uh, but I think like I made a, a new bike out of it again. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, it is amazing to get the bike back. Uh, yeah. However, uh, uh, I think everyone must understand that I can't ride that bike in the sense that I cannot uh, officially, legally ride it. I just take it out for some small trips, 100 meters, 200 meters, maybe a kilometer around the place and back where yeah. it is safe, where, uh, you know, so uh, it is not uh, roadworthy in the sense that I don't have a registration and I cannot re-register the bike. Yeah, that is until it becomes a proper vintage uh, bike. It has to Absolutely. reach a certain amount of years since manufacturing. So yes, I think that will not be too far around the corner though for the Yamaha. I think a couple of years you might be able to get into that category and uh, yes, then take it out on maybe slightly longer rides around. Um, yes, yes. I would love to do that because that, yeah. that would be lovely. Uh, also, I'll clarify that this is a proper restoration that you've undertaken. Uh, it is not what a lot of people call resto modding nowadays. When you can't source parts, you essentially just upgrade them to newer parts or uh, with other bikes compatible parts. This is as authentic a restoration as you could undertake with a bike like this, which is uh, why the time uh, it took to get it done was so long. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So moving on, the next uh, question is, what are the cars you've had uh, exposure to growing up like that you own personally and what do you currently have with you? Yeah. So uh, the first car that I bought for myself was a Maruti 800 uh, uh, second hand, probably third or fourth hand. I'm not sure what it, what, how many hands it had gone through, but it was an old car I bought. I paid, I think, almost about 90 or 95,000 rupees for that yeah. uh, and bought that car. And the uh, not much to talk about the car, it's just that it used to move, uh, did give trouble. Uh, but why I was mentioning it, because I bought that car, because as a bachelor, I used to have a dog, a German Shepherd, uh, Kaiser right. and uh, one to move the dog from one place to the other I needed a car you couldn't go on leave go somewhere yeah. else without him so therefore one bought a car for that so that was the first one that I bought for myself with my own money yeah uh, after that uh, one has had Indica uh, which uh, um, Tata Tata's Indica sturdy yeah. car so there was one one thing I always used to say after driving a Maruti Indica uh, when you're driving on a highway and a truck passed you it yeah. did not jump. Which <laughs> yeah. 800 would, you know, Buffeting. you could yeah, feel yeah. that the 800 is moving away and <laughs> yeah. going sideways. Yeah. Uh, Indica was firmly on ground and it moved. Yeah. A very sturdy car. Yeah. Uh, of course, um, uh, by then the power steering and other things had come in. So therefore, uh, it was an easy drive and a, and a good car to have uh, and a strong car with a strong uh, engine in front. Uh, I kept that car for about uh, eight years and then... Um, uh, you know, I was moving out of the country. There was yeah. no point of keeping a car for four years uh, parked. So I disposed of the car. Yeah. And uh, then recently, after having a lot of discussions with you, I have picked up a Creta. Yeah. Now, uh, the Creta is a, is, a, is a good car that I have bought from the point of view that uh, basic reason I wanted was uh, boot space so that I can put my golf set there. Yeah. And uh, we are four of us uh, and my mother. So we were looking at somewhere where all of us, although we don't go for too many long drives, yeah. uh, but uh, four of us can sit and, uh, you know, uh, comfortably, four of us and my mother, five of us can sit and travel comfortably from one place to the other. Yeah. Uh, although we don't go for long drives, but I must tell you that I have gone for long drives on this car, um, driven from, uh, from, say, Kanpur to uh, all the way to Dehradun. Yeah, uh, and uh, it's been very comfortable and very very uh, good to handle car. 
Yeah, it's almost a jack of all trades because <clears throat> it uh, it drives well. It's got all the features you want, and it's so spacious, especially for its yes. size. Yes, it it is a special. So it's not a big car, but it's not yeah. a small car either. Yeah, so that is the it, thing. But I must, I uh, sweet spot. Yeah, right. Before we, yeah, yeah. So before we go ahead, we I also bought another car for my mother recently, and uh, again uh, with a lot of uh, guidance and discussion with you, uh, mm -hmm, yeah. uh, you know, went in for a went in for a punch. Yeah, uh, Tata punch. Um, mm -hmm. Two two features like uh, one discussion that uh, you and I had was that hmm. uh, did not want a car where uh, sitting getting into the car becomes difficult. Yeah. Don't want a vehicle like um, a Creta or any other bigger one because getting too inside high. again becomes a problem. Yeah. Too high. So therefore, uh, punch was the right decision for one getting in and getting out for a person like my mother who's uh, 84 is uh, very very convenient. And the yeah. second is, which no one, most people don't notice, is that door, front door opens 90 degrees. So yeah. that gives a lot of space for the person to get in and get out. Uh, yeah. Rest, I think all the features which my Creta has, uh, the punch also has. So there is no, except for the sunroof, yeah. everything else is there. So therefore, it's as comfortable a drive as it is. And it's a good car again. Yeah, and for a very solid budget also, it doesn't really yes. burn a big yes. hole in your pocket. So it's, it it's a it good, uh, sturdy proposition. It is, and, it is. Um, also, uh, do you have any road tripping plans coming up with either of the cars? Oh, yes, I do. And uh, I, I mean, uh, I would love to do these road trips and I'm planning one which is uh, wanting to drive along the coast of India, yeah. both the eastern and western coast. I want to drive along that. Yeah. Uh, that is one uh, project that I intend to do. Yeah. And the second project that I intend to do or drive around I want to do is chase the monsoons. So that is start from uh, Kerala somewhere and come yeah. all the way up to Bombay, uh, chasing the monsoons uh, there. Uh, this is something that uh, one wants to do it. Uh, maybe one will start planning and take it this year or next year. Let's see how it works Sounds out. Fantastic. But I would love to do this. Yeah. And if you need a co-driver, I'm always there. I'll be very happy. Oh, wow. That, that, that will be the most amazing part uh, which will happen. And maybe we can climb, uh, we can combine both of these. Yeah. Just time it right. And I think you can do both uh, uh, consecutively or as part of the same trip. Yes, we could be, that uh, could be done. Also, so I brought this up because I am planning on undertaking, I am undertaking a very big road trip next month, which is uh, driving the Golden Quadrilateral, the entire 6,000 wow. kilometers of the Golden Quadrilateral, starting from Bombay and then going all the way around Delhi, Calcutta, Chennai and back. And um, this is because it's marking 25 years this year since the foundation was laid down for this project by Prime Minister Atul Bihari Vajpayee. So uh, it's a very exciting project for me. It's a very big undertaking. I've not done anything like this, at least to this scale before. And it'll all be solo. So I thought, uh, since you've been driving for so long, especially in our country, uh, is there any advice you would give me on, uh, on undertaking this trip? Yeah, definitely. Uh, more than driving myself, I think uh, in the army, we move uh, in convoys yeah. uh, from one place to the other. And uh, there are certain rules which may not directly apply in the same uh, quantification mode uh, to you, but yeah. you should keep those in mind. Uh, so one of the first rule which always was there was start early, end early. Yeah. So you can start even before the sun rises, but you should end at least two to three hours before the sun sets, minimum. Yeah. Yeah. So you should reach your destination before that. The second thing was we, uh, you know, when we started the first, uh, uh, once you start, the first drive was about two and a half hours without a break. And after that, every one and a half hours, you took a break. That, of course, well, was the purpose of keeping the attention. convoy together. Yeah. And and giving the break to the drivers and, uh, you know, uh, having a drink, having tea or yeah. having a glass of water, people relieving yeah. themselves. So that, that break is also important because, uh, uh, you know, sometimes Focus you're sitting drop. like that. You, yeah. Yes. And, and your feet can go numb, uh, yeah. you know, if there is a, somewhere you've sat uh, uncomfortably or something. Yeah. So therefore, yeah. walking a little, doing that. So that is the second thing which is there. Yeah. And uh, the uh, third point, of course, which is a more... Uh, uh, point for your uh, the work that you do is if you can identify some interesting portions uh, interesting aspects of the portion that you're traveling in 
and yeah. touch that uh, every day uh, that will make your uh, entire journey more interesting for you also and yeah. then of course i'm being selfish and when i watch your video i would love to see <laughs> where all you went and what is it that you did which i can also follow later absolutely i will give all of these uh, proper consideration and uh, i will try and plan my route in such a way that uh, i do end up hitting some interesting points and um, yeah it has uh, been really wonderful catching up with you i think we're pretty much out of time now so um, thank you so much for coming on the show and i hope it was a good experience for you as it was for me no no it's it's very exciting that firstly you uh, thought that uh, you you could invite me and i'm so very happy and so thankful for you for inviting me and like i said that uh, i'm very impressed with the work that you're doing and uh, you should continue doing that and i know you're going to um, uh, make it better and better as you go ahead with especially these road trips which you're trying and the kind of cars you are touching is just amazing i've not even seen those cars that you've uh, been doing your videos on they're so interesting uh, to see and all the very best to you and uh, keep growing uh, stronger and bigger and uh, better with the work that you're doing all the very best thank you so much i think we'll call it a meeting there and all right i'll see you guys next time